the, uh, the whales have been a tremendous comeback story. And if you heard anything about whale, whale washing for gray whales is tough because they're migrating and you've got to chase them. But if you go to Monterey, the humpback whales, they breed south and they come to Monterey because all this upwelling causes a tremendous uh, boom in life and it, it, they come here to feed. And so the wife and I went in mid-August and it, it was really marvelous. We were kind of hugging each other. It was such a spectacular event. But as we went out to the place where there was a lot of upwelling, we, we had like 300 dolphins following us in the boat, escorting us. And all of a sudden, we hit, see a, a cauldron of about 500 uh, California sea lions come to the surface. And then five or six humpbacks came up. And, and the sea lions have learned to follow the humpback. The humpbacks sort of have these uh, fish finders that they do better. So the sea lions kind of follow them. And they stayed for about five or ten minutes and jumped down because there's all this fish life that was going on. And I, and I did about a 360 span around me. And there was about five of these cauldrons of sea lions and, and, and humpback whales jumping. We had a few of them come right up to the boat. You can and there's two reasons for this rebound. One is uh, the La Niña's right now it causes more upwelling. The other I'd like to suggest is due to CO2. We sort of see this curve wherever you look, off the West Coast, Australia, Antarctica, this tremendous rebound in whales, and it correlates perfectly with CO2. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Well, actually, there is a very indirect connection. During the Little Ice Age, Whales were hunted to the near extinction for their blubber, for their oil. People were shivering during the Ice Age, and they wanted lamp oil. When we developed an alternative energy source, petroleum, that relieved the pressure of this hunting of all the marine mammals, the, the sea lions, the walruses, elephant seals, they were all being hunted for their blubber, almost to extinction. And when you leave that pressure, you allow them to come back. Now, regulations help, but regulations in themselves won't do it. You just have to look to Africa. They have regulations against poaching elephants and rhinos. Not only regulations, they put armed guards around the preserves. But when you have a failed economy, you still go out and hunt them. So you really need some kind of alternatives to, uh, of calories for people. The other thing that's caused the whales to return is upwelling. And we know in the Little Ice Age, when solar energy was low, so was upwelling. We can tell this by looking at fish scales and fish bones and whatever. And as, as the ocean started to warm, as the solar energy started to increase, we had increased upwelling. What upwelling does is takes these nutrients that have sunk to the dark abyss, and it lifts them up into the sunlight, where now plankton can photosynthesize. And that sets a burst for the whole food web. You get more zooplankton, you get more fish, you get more whales. And here's your question about ocean acidification. This upwelling is a tremendous benefit. If you do a vertical profile of the ocean, if you look at the surface, the pH is going to be around 8.2 to 8.3. As you drop down, what you see is it gets, it very quickly becomes more acidic. It's because as it is, it is the bacteria uh, digest everything, we start releasing the carbon. You can see that it, in, in an upwelling zone, you can see it's down to 7.7. And, and, and when it upwells, it brings it right to the coast. So people say, well, on average, the pH is getting more. Well, they don't know that. It's modeled. And it's modeled only either more CO2 causes, causes more acidity. But we don't have the data. The pH data is extremely sparse. And, and it cannot accurately average the tremendous variability in pH that happens over different depths, different locations, over different years and seasons, and they can differ dramatically hourly at the same location. Elkhorn slough goes from 8.4 sometimes, drops all the way down to 7.4. Then it's bouncing back and forth between 8.2, 7.9. A few miles away, the daily pH varies between 8.3 and 7.9, but the pattern of daily pH variations differ from Elkhorn Slough and Monterey Bay. If you look on seasonal, our upwelling season along California happens, starts in the spring. And what you can see, the blue is the more acidic, the red is, is the more alkaline. During the spring, upwelling brings more acidic waters to the surface. And then those acidic waters drop during the summer and fall. They have did moorings off of Oregon. And even within a season, you see these spikes. And CO2, the, this baseline here, represents the level of CO2 in the atmosphere. In the water, it will go two or three times greater than that during these upwell events. But it only takes about a week for it to drop down and drop down below what atmospheric concentrations are. 
And this is because it's driven by something called the biological pump. CO2 is plant food. The more the plants are photosynthesizing, the, the greater the abundance you have in the marine productivity. And then you have fish and, and krill and stuff that are eating the plankton. Their fecal pellets take that carbon right down to the bottom of the ocean until it's upwelled again. So what we can see is even though it's gone two or three times higher than atmospheric CO2, it drops down lower than what it's been since the Little Ice Age. So how much is pH doing it? I, I really don't trust any of the studies that say we're, we're having problems. Usually when they see it acidic, and they said something off here on the coast that some of these shells are dissolving, it's upwelling zone. And what's amazing is things like diatoms, where they live in, in hev heavily upwell areas, they don't have calcareous shells that could dissolve in acid. They have uh, silicon siliceous shells that won't dissolve. So I think there's been an evolution that they know there's certain places there's high acidity, and they've evolved to adapt into that. But people like horror stories. If you're a good teacher, you know if you want to keep your audience, if you just explain the mechanics of science, you get eyes that start to shudder. But if you tell them a good scary story, people jump all over it. This scary story was inspired by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. In the 60s, there was this heavy upwelling. It, brought a lot, it produced a lot of diatoms, a lot of phytoplankton. Well, if some of those diatoms produce this poison called domoic acid, it causes shellfish amnesia. The fish eat the, the plankton, concentrate it, and when the birds eat it, they get it. Well, along the California coast, because of all this upwelling, we get birds called the sooty shearwater that nest in New Zealand. As soon as they get through breeding, they fly all the way up here. They're one of the most common birds along the coast. They don't nest here, they nest in New Zealand. And they, they, their numbers multiply when we have, the, have this upwelling. Well, they happen to eat some of these fish that had a lot of this poison. They got disoriented. They started flying into Monterey. They were flying into buildings, flying into people, flying into the pavement. It was insane. It was nature against man, is the way people took it. And the newspaper reports were read by Alfred Hitchcock. He says, ah, I, got, I got an idea. And this became one of the, the, the more famous horror stories of nature turning against people. But it, it was really a natural event that was misconstrued. I mean, climate scientists know they want to, you know, we want to get people excited about climate change. And so they realize a horror genre of, of stories is really going to get people excited. And the first in this genre of climate horror movies, or climate horror publications, is called Climate and Species Range. And this is sort of what sucked me into this more than anything else. It was written by Parmesan, Camille Parmesan, 1996. It was a celebrated paper. Uh, she got invited to the Clinton uh, White House to speak on how climate change was disrupting the environment. She became invited to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Control. Her, she became one of the most cited scientists for showing how climate change was affecting the environment. And I think she had one of the worst papers I ever read. <laughs> no. What she focused on was the Edith Checkerspot butterfly. In the 1900s, the Edith Checkerspot butterfly was the most abundant butterfly in California, especially in, in Southern California. As urban sprawl spread across Southern California, prime habitat was destroyed. And we saw the rapid declines in the butterfly. And people were comparing it to the demise of the passenger pigeon. It was so quick. And, and so all the conservation, we've we got to protect land, we've got to protect habitat. But that, and all the evidence, and it still says this, was all local, local landscape changes, plus a little fluctuation with natural cycles. But that doesn't mean you can't make a good climate horror story out of their demise. Jim Hansen's NASA funded her to do this study, and she went up and down California. You give her credit, she took her four years to do this, but she took all the documented populations and she saw where they still existed and where they didn't. And so the purple is where they went extinct. The green was saying where they were still alive. And she called this the, the range had changed. Well, if you look at this, the range really didn't change. What happened was the density changed a little. So it was really a bad title. But she, the statistical center had moved northward and upwards. She said, this is just what the climate scientists predicted. Like Hans said, it's going to get warmer. Everything's going to be pushed northward and upward. Well, I looked at it and said, well, if, if you get one population here and right next door, the other one's surviving the other ones extinct, it, it's probably landscape changes. So I asked to try to replicate the story. So I looked, this is published in Nature. So I went to look at the method section so I could replicate, because a, a, a lot of this stuff happened in sort of my research backyard here in the Sierra Nevadas. 
And, and, I, and I was pretty sure it was all landscape change. Well, there was no method section. And what we teach all our scientists, all our students, the one thing you have to do is have a good method section. It's not science until it's independently replicated. So this, so the, the issue is well vetted. And you can't do that without a good method section. So I, I emailed and I said, do you have a supplementary data? I, I'd like to do this with a, a view towards landscape change. Well, I got crickets, or butterflies. The, uh, after almost a year of no response, I called her and she picks up the phone and I said, hey, yeah, you haven't answered my emails, but I'm, I'm trying to get your data replicated. She said, I'm not giving you my data. Well, that's really not very scientific. <laughs> so this is what pushed me to kind of write this kind of stuff. So we had about a year of going back and forth. They say, why are you trying to stop independent replication? Or her husband who did a lot of this work with, he's Dr. Michael Singer, um, he's been trying to dissuade me. He said, you really don't want to do it. It's too much hard work. And besides, all the things that we said extinct are in the Sierra, most of them have returned. Now, to me, I was horrified. And it also says, here's one problem when you see this debate in the peer literature. If things don't go your way, you don't publish. You, don't publish. you stick with this story. Um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I think it was an old joke. Well, it, and what he said is almost all these different populations of purple in the Sierra had returned. And, and I'm good friends with Paul Oppler. He, was, he thought the story was crazy. He, he was the invertebrate specialist for the endangered species act. So it, and I tried to replicate it. I wanted to publish it. She wouldn't let me. But it got worse. It, it, if you look at it, what, what is how did you blame global warming? If you knew the biology of this, caterp this butterfly, the caterpillars will crawl for a day or two to find a microclimate where they can raise their body temperature 10 degrees higher than the maximum temperature. Yet she was blaming global warming. That didn't make any sense to me. She also said this is consistent with the global warming theory. Again, she used this top-down global average to explain a local event. But if you look at Yosemite data, it's very similar to what I had in Tahoe City. If you look at what the 30s were, they were much warmer than what we see now. So how do you blame global warming? So she was getting criticism from that. So she published a new paper. She uh, repackaged a study that her and her husband did in Sequoia National Park. The original research examined metapopulation dynamics between a population living in its natural habitat and feeding on a sturdy perennial plant versus a population that ventured out in newly colonized habitat in an adjacent logged area and had begun feeding on a different annual plant that was a much less reliable food plant. Well, the population that opportunistically colonized the log area began to suffer from cold snaps and early snows and was eventually extirpated. So Parmesan wrote that the extirpations of the butterflies in the logged area was due to extreme cold weather caused by global warming. And this was the mechanism showing how populations were being forced upward and northward by CO2 warming. In addition, to the cold paradox, to make it a climate horror story, she had to focus only on the logged area. She never shared her evidence that the butterflies here in the natural habitat had survived better than previously ever observed. But if the whole story with the thriving butterflies in their natural habitat had been honestly told, then it would have been clear that the butterflies were very resilient in their natural habitat. But logging had changed the microclimate, and that the microclimate sent the wrong signals which caused the extirpations. It's amazing her interpretation survived peer review because the ridiculousness of the climate change interpretation would have been obvious. If you looked back to the original study, like I did, it became even more bizarre. <clears throat> the populations that went extinct were five feet away from the ones that survived. And, and, and CO2 doesn't work surgically like this. Extreme weather doesn't work surgically like this. It's a landscape issue. Here was the logged area in the act. I call this an X-rated horror movie. The, uh, they went extinct. The zeros are, are the populations that survived, and they survived better than she ever witnessed. But she published this as extreme weather is killing them and driving them northward. Now, I showed you the, the extreme weather with droughts and, uh, and heat waves. And, and scientists who were writing about more extreme weather loved this story. It fit what they wanted, because they weren't finding extremes. But this was a story they could say, Oh, look, a little bit of CO2 change. See how it's killing everything. And I don't know how they didn't look at this, because I, I could look it up in an hour. You know, but they went and they had her co-author, and they published and said, here's the way this extreme weather is killing things and causing them to move northward. I started looking at a lot of the stuff she did. 
in England, her husband said, look at her Great Britain studies. Well, I did. The picture to the right was published in 1999. I said, here's global warming. It's pushing this butterfly, the speckled wood, northward towards Scotland. The black dots represent all the known populations before 1940. The red dots show how they started to move northward. In, uh, they started to go into Scotland. They started uh, colonizing more in the south it, between 1940 and 69. And then the turquoise represents how they showed up from 1970 to 1997. So here's proof. And th this study was cited by about 2,000 different consensus scientists. Well, in five minutes, I knew a story, but probably was a little familiar with this. The Scottish butterfly experts had talked about this butterfly for years. The picture to your left was published in 1949. It's a picture of Scotland that I've circled in red on the upper side. All those dots, all those numbers are known populations. But her story ignored that. She made the story look like, oh, here's global warming pushing it. Well, his story, if you read it, these populations were more abundant <laughs> between 1800 and 1940. There's these natural population cycles for, for reasons that I've talked to some uh, experts there. They're really not sure what happened. But when you leave that part of the story out, you're creating a horror story that's not on it. The more research I did, the, the Actually, the more disgusted I felt, the, the, the scientific literature I feel is being spammed with, with bad science. I think those papers are, are easily, I try to get a retraction, but they, that was futile. The golden toad was considered the iconic species, the, the, species, the one species that went complete, complete, completely extinct, and they're blaming it on global warming. They blamed it on CO2. The first, this species was first discovered in 1966. By 1989, it had gone extinct. When they first discovered it, it was very limited in, in uh, its location, and uh, they created the Monteverde Cloud Preserve to help protect it. The year before it died, they counted 1,500. Not a word about it being stressed in any kind of way. The next year, none. Maybe one or two, and then the following year, none. Uh, this species is, is, is very quirky. It lives its whole life in burrows. So they have no observations. It comes out for two weeks to mate in the rainy season, and goes back to his burrow. Out of 1,500 frogs, they didn't find a carcass. So this guy, Alan Pounds, says it's global warming. He first argued that global warming was amplifying heat in the mountains and raising the clouds and drying the land. Advocates of climate's high sensitivity of CO2 created a model to support his scenario, and quickly Pounds joined Parmesan on the IPCC. But it turned out that the real killer a disease caused by a newly discovered fungus, preferred cool temperatures and wetter conditions. Well, around the rest of the world, another story was developing. People were finding frogs dying in different places. But they weren't dying according to global warming theory. They were dying where it was cooler. In Arizona and Australia, they were dying in the winter. In places where you had a species that lived in a hot lowlands and spanned all the way up to a cool highlands, the hot lowlands are doing better than ever. The high, cooler places, that's where they were dying. So a number of researchers said, I think this is due to a pathogen that likes cool temperatures. And they went out and they did perfect science to show that's exactly what's true. They inoculated uh, healthy ones that got the same thing. They looked at, at all those little creepy bottles with the specimens and found that when they had these uh, extinction events, it's only when this showed up. The real take-home story about the death of the golden toad is the way diseases are transmitted around the world. It was researchers. The uh, African clawed frog has been used in research for embryological studies, for pregnancy tests, and it's been taken from Africa all around the world. It's immune to the disease, but it looks like it's spread it all around the world. <coughs> Where our money should be is not trying to say, look what CO2 is doing, but say, how are diseases spread? And I think this recent Ebola case sort of magnifies that issue. If where you want your money, it's not trying to say CO2 is doing it, it's, it is there. How does it get spread? It's not spread by global warming. It's, it's spread by rapid transportation. And we should spend more money looking at this because diseases can jump around the world at lightning speed. 